So what Gandhi ji has told us when we got independence, we should see he had the vision about what India should be. But today we are all heckling at him. The way policies are there, we are only emulating the West, our colonizers. But there is nothing Indian about what we are doing today. Nothing really Indian about what we are doing today. We talk so much about our heritage, etc. He said, God forbid that India should ever take to industrialism in the manner of the West. It would, it, if it took to say, same economic exploitation, it would strip the world bare of locusts. We are talking about dominating over the world, doing business like producing like China. If China is consuming half the world's coal today. And if India also takes to the same industrialism, the entire energy the world needs will be cornered by China and India. What the rest of the world should do and what it will lead to consequences in the world if there is so much of competition for resources. Then he also said Britain took half the resources of the planet. If India should take to same thing, how many planets are required? Today, this is the same thing. Ecological footprint concept has come. And he says, if we have to live like an average European, we need four or five planets. And we have only one planet. And all the talk of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk of going and occupying some planet somewhere in the space, it's all meaningless because you can't live there. This is the only planet, living planet that science knows. Science has not identified any other planet anywhere near reachable where life can survive. And if we have such a beautiful planet and because of our the way of our greed, we are destroying the living planet and making it into a rock. And we are breaking everything. I think then. Okay. Now I, ta I ta give you the Ernest F. Schumacher was a, our advisor to our planning commission in the 60s. He is known for his Buddhist economics. Now there is a Schumacher College in London where they taught, teach about ecology and things like that. Then he said for India, what kind of economic system we should have? The system of production by masses, not by mass, mass production. Mass production will make so many people unemployed, then worthless, socially unproductive. Earlier we had so much of uh, artisans. They were doing things, producing things for the society. Today they are useless. What happened in the UK when the first textile machines came, the Luddite movement, what they talk about, has happened because of that. These, these weavers, they wanted employment in the textile mills. They said, we don't want you. You are all skilled. You ask for more higher wages. Anybody can work on these textile machines. So they have not employed them. So there was a rebellion, but it was suppressed very violently. They were hanged to the posts on the streets. So many weavers were killed in UK to make the textile revolution possible. So the, everything that comes is and has problems, consequences, human consequences. So India for its population of 1.4 billion, we have to employ more people to be involved. Today, so much of unemployment, so much of destitution, 90% of Indians are not living any good life. It's only the 10%, all of us here, who are enjoying all the benefits. We are a mini, mini America or mini Europe in India. That's a fact. Okay. Cli Today we are living in a climate constrained world. The, the 20th, 19th century thinking, 20th century thinking also is not suitable now. We, everything that we do is linked to what happens to the climate. Because the way we produce, the way we consume, the way we do everything, the way we are doing agriculture, the pesticides we are spraying in our uh, fields, everything is linked to ultimately to the uh, climate, how it is changing the climate. So, for example, in India, how many people really understand about consequences of climate change? No, hardly any. How many people here, you, you have read how many articles on uh, climate? Not many people may have read much. Our newspapers are also not writing much about it. Whereas in other countries, there are so many agitations. Right now in UK, the women are in the forefront of the agitation because they are saying we are mothers. We know the pain of what happens to my children and grandchildren. There's just stop oil is one movement that is happening. They say we don't want oil. If you don't stop the oil, we don't stop the new oil and coal. 
we we will not live we will not be able to exist here on this planet so let us move away from coal go to renewable energy but this present conservative government of uk it is now licensing more oil exploitation in the north sea and also shale oil and gas on the land so there is big agitation in uk uh, against this so similarly everywhere in other countries because there is more awareness about climate in those countries not in our country so first of all our industries should move more move more towards climate compliance what are they doing for example i tell you indian government is promoting alcohol factories ethanol factories in a big way they that ethanol is to be blended in petrol i will cover that in detail after the last some few slides is it really saving the carbon emissions and how many cars are there in india i i look out the chart for 1000 people in india there are 22 cars and only in the cars you can use ethanol and nowhere else just for feeding only 20% of ethanol into the cars how much of agricultural land you are transferring into produce producing energy and not food and are you saving carbon emissions you don't save carbon emissions carbon emissions will increase further so what is the point we are neither saving the foreign exchange we are neither saving this this is because some people are interested policies are driven by politics and we we citizens are not participating in the uh, debate so this this is these are the things that are happening what is in the interest of the people what is in the interest of the nation that should be debated somebody should not tell us from there how to do or what to do that is the problem we are a deficient democracy that is our problem is there any are we doing anything to replace coal oil and gas i can tell you all the new proposals that come with all the alcohol plants they have a captive power plant run with coal see the see the fun it is in it is a green fuel you are telling you are adding to the petrol and saving uh, energy and you are using a coal fired power plant very highly inefficient power plant because it is subcritical only 30% or 33% of the energy is converted into electricity actually after the 12th five year plan the government decided a policy we will not allow any subcritical technology power plants there was a prison but afterwards the people have gone the, the the investors and industries have gone and influenced the government policy and they have changed that and one industry was permitted in uh, telangana after the violent uh, uh, opposition by the local people and finally they were given environmental clearance but the company has not come up because he cannot produce economically he cannot sell it this is the problem why are we doing things which are not feasible economically feasible and which are not in the interest of the people why are we changing the policies for wrong reasons that is the issue the industry is opting for small five, five i told you technologies adopted are mostly as outdated hazardous and wasteful i can tell you about this particularly in chemical industry horrible chemical industries are coming up which are discarded in the western countries they are not bothered about how many people died however water is poison and we have very poor quality regulation and everything is very bad it is not in the interest of the public it is only in the interest of saying that we are increasing our gdp and increasing our gdp how it is improving the lives of the people it is something that we have to debate as citizens it is not to be taken as easily environmental impact projects of project presented to people are dishonest we are resorting to deception of the people we got a right from the international agreements at the rio that people should participate in a democracy in the development what is the voice we are giving to the people we are not giving to the people if you want to build a real good country let us take for example small country like uruguay uruguay is smaller than telangana in population that country has totally moved over to renewable energy such a small country 100% renewable energy why we are not able to do telangana has started 9000 megawatts of coal fired power plants after the paris agreement after the paris agreement after india has signed telangana is not outside india what is binding to india is binding to telangana also and with what we will do that and whenever people or citizens have opposed this kind of development they are called this is something they are doing a 
there is a conspiracy against the government they are calling it conspiracy recently court has given a judgment against the um, the veerlapal ultra mega power plant saying that they have cancelled the ec and they said you redo everything and get another permission for that the minister was saying that it's a conspiracy against what is conspiracy in that if you cannot defend it in the court and the environmental whose conspiracy can work in the court this is a very unfortunate situation we always don't value environment we think economy is the primary but one thing you should for, you cannot forget there is no economy without environment you need raw materials energy where from it comes it this is the is the crust of the earth that is providing you all that without that what kind of economy you can have this is a fundamental flaw in our thinking we have been drilled into our mind that economy is priority on a on a on a dead planet who can live on a dead planet on a bio biodiversity we are killing daily 200 species is going extinct every day 200 species is going extinct with the, such a planet with with loss of biodiversity we will not have food to eat also what kind of planet we are building why we are neglecting the basic truths that science is telling you the entire industrialism is based on the modern science the same science is telling you this is inconvenient when climate science was growing and telling the truth it is the corporate interests which have belittled the scientists which have denied the science for last 40 years the corporate companies have been fighting against any regulation and they have been belittling and insulting and abusing the scientists who are telling the truth it is true women scientists particularly in in, in climate science they have been threatened with rape and murder abused in the western countries not in india because the, we don't have so many people uh, doing such, such research there this is a fact exxon mobil bp chevron and their think tanks heritage foundation uh, Heartland Institute, Kato Institute, all these corporate-funded think tanks, they have been working against science, against the factual science. But today, what is, is you can see it now. You look outside, you can say, our uh, chairman is telling us, see, the rainy season has changed. Anybody can observe. You don't have to be a scientist for that. That's the whole thing. So there is no second uh, economy without natural resources. Then World Bank, what, what World Bank, it's not somebody else's work. World Bank told us we are losing 5.7% of gross national GDP every year because of our environmental degradation. 5.7% of GDP. What is our growth rate we claim about? 7%, 8%. 5.7% is gone for environmental degradation. What do you do about it? One uh, in Daesh Bank uh, CEO, one uh, Pavan, I, I am not able to recall his name. He made a millennium report for the biodiversity thing. He said in India, the loss of uh, natural resources, natural uh, losses, or biodiversity loss, etc., totally computed. Himachal Pradesh was losing the highest in the country. On an average, we were losing around 16% of our natural wealth in this country because of the so called policies that we are following. Pawan Sukhdev. Pawan Sukhdev was the person who has written that report. He's a he was with the uh, in, in Daesh Bank. This is the problem. These are not some uh, some just pep talk. It is serious reports and research. We are greenwashing everything. We say we are planting trees. However, planting trees doesn't solve any problem. At least I have done. There are so many peer-reviewed problems, research papers. They said you plant the entire planet with trees entire planet don't leave any space for the agriculture it will reduce the temperature by only 0.5 degrees centigrade nothing else and then what do we eat particularly planting in the polar regions and uh, canada like places it is detrimental it actually enhances the heating of the planet because those places boreal forests there there's there's snow in it snow reflects the sunlight when you don't have sunlight when you have trees cover it is brown or green so whenever sunlight cannot reflect sun so effectively so the temperatures increase only in the equator region tree plantation will be of some consequence and where is the space for example telangana government has started with the big fanfare that we will go for 270 crore trees in the planet we calculated simple calculation as per the cpcb 
standards if we have to plant so many trees how much of telangana land space is required we found that it is 9% of telangana's land area is required to complete the harita aram where is that land you started the dalit the land program of 3 acres each and we would no 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 not many dalits were given any that land only initially few were given and there the program has closed nothing is happening on that end 9% of the land area how, how do you get to plantation now we need more and more land now you are bringing more and more land to cultivation with the lift irrigation projects so if you want to bring more cultivation then there can be no land, trees planted so this is uh, nafiz ahmed is a an expert on uh, security systems etc he said system is now ready to collapse that is what he according to his understanding particularly about the uk system trust government he said accelerating conditions of change beyond the capability of the british institutions to adapt they are generating crisis across multiple institutions simultaneously in such a way that they are overwhelming the overall system's ability to respond so we are a complex society there is a theory called theory of complex societies professor joseph tainter has written a book collapse of complex societies he is an archaeologist he has studied all the civilizations that have collapsed up to now 32 civilizations existed on this planet on the earth they flourished they reached a peak of their glory but where are they now why did they collapse this is industrial civilization is also one thing like that our venkatraman ramakrishna novel laureate also said humans are also one species so many species have gone extinct if we don't learn we can also go extinct we, we but we are thinking that we can do anything and get away that is the whole problem we have to engage ourselves very seriously and we have to transform ourselves if we want our children to live well this is uh, professor uh, david king sir david king he was scientific advisor to the british government early he was uh, on the cop also at the time we have to act quickly what we do believe in the next 3 to 4 years will determine the future of humanity that's all before 2030 our future is totally sealed if we don't act now so rapidly there is nothing we can do afterwards that's why that that worry concern is there i, I can speak here as pleasingly we can tell that we can do this we can do that we can take india as a super power people may like it but science is not concerned with that science if you have if you truly believe recently i have also read one report by university of lazanne public engage, engagement by the academics and scientists so how responsible we should be to tell truth to the people we should not talk to please people what they like and what not for getting claps we have an we have an obligation to inform the truth however unpalatable it is okay this is she is a daughter of a nobel laureate in physics julia steinberger she was recently arrested in switzerland for doing an act of protest imagine why women scientists professors internationally known and a lead ipcc author she has to go onto the road and lie across the road to stop the asking swiss government to declare climate emergency what she was asking is declare climate emergency for that she she was arrested everybody is doing non violent civil disobedience actions when they are doing that now british conservative government is bringing a new police rule saying that they can be fined heavily they can be jailed but earlier the government and courts also whenever the government arrested this civil non non violent dis civil disobedience the court has always been acquitting these people they were telling they are they are focusing on a serious issue for humanity the you whenever there is a danger for humanity people can violate the law there is nothing wrong that is what this for example if your house is on fire somebody outside can come and barge into your house to save you that is not a violation of the law because normally it is considered trespass you can't enter others houses forcibly but when to save somebody you can do that this is exactly same thing the government and courts are saying if there is a danger to the people and if it is for good purpose for uh, for common good this can be done and david goodstein a, a physicist from university of california berkeley he said civilization as we know 
has come to some time in this century we are in the danger this civilization industrial civilization may not last long if we continue so many children hold placards and the demonstrations business as usual is equal to death that is how the children are understanding but there is we elders are not able to understand young children 8 years 10 years are asking their prime minister why should we go to school and study yes we are studying science but you are not valuing the science we are learning in our school why you are asking us to study that science which you are not valuing yes they are able to ask us but we are not doing that here So what I'm going to talk about here today is, is the urgency of Michael Mann Professor Michael Mann listen in addressing the climate crisis. You all know the litany if you're watching the news uh, China's worst heat uh wave on record <clears throat> record heat in London a third of Pakistan underwater Canada's strongest ever storm an unprecedented landfalling hurricane striking the west coast of Florida and that's just the past few months the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle we are seeing them play out in real time in the form of these extreme weather disasters the urgency of climate action is crystal clear but let's talk about the agency of climate action in the new climate war i warn about the threat of doomism and despair uh, for potential leads us down the path of disengagement and polluters would much rather see you disengaged and on the sidelines than out there on the front lines demanding change so we must recognize that it's not too late to prevent catastrophic climate change impacts the obstacles aren't physical they're not technological they are entirely political so you must use your voice and students here at Penn are doing that you are using your voice in a very powerful way but there's another very powerful way to use your voice and that's your vote in a matter of weeks there is a midterm election that will determine the for uh, the, the future course of climate action and in fact the future course of our democracy here in the United States and as goes the united states when it comes to democracy and climate action goes the rest of the world so this election couldn't be more important uh, and it's critical that you turn out and you vote vote for climate champions vote out climate deniers and delayers the future of our planet literally lies in the balance and so i will reduce my talk to simply one word vote thank you Is the issued by professor james hansen who was the scientist who warned the world first about global warming he went before the american senate and told them that global warming has already happening it was in 1988 remember this after 1988 his warning 60% of all the carbon in the atmosphere was emitted in between 1990 and today imagine that how careless we have been after knowing the fact that climate change is already happening the worlds have enhanced burning of coal and oil and today the all the 60% of carbon dioxide remaining in the atmosphere was released during this last 30 years that is that is the situation so he predicted recently releasing it next year 2024 we will see an average increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade already that is the latest graph that, that photos are coming on its way if you can move it they can see the actual okay. point remove the, remove the photos okay. in in in, in uh, yeah, uh, there you can see it's crossing the uh, that's you can see that crow 2024 that 1.5 degrees centigrade we will reach already next year we will reach 1.2 above this is it there is no way its things are going there is no respect because it is physics it doesn't bother about what we think what we like what we dislike next please okay this another problem who is causing this climate crisis and who is paying the price recently we have seen the tragedy in pakistan 
they may be our enemies politically for some reason but they are people they have suffered for nothing they are not responsible for the carbon emissions 33 million people flooded and uh, left homeless how sad it is it can happen to us also that's why and united nation secretary general warned don't think that it doesn't happen to you it can happen to you any time anywhere in the world so in this coming two years say any tragedy can happen in india also so the who are responsible top 1% of the richest people in the world they are responsible for about uh, nearly a quarter of the emissions more than 60 and 50, 10% of the richest people in the world are responsible for half the emissions of the world bottom 50% of the people poor people they are responsible for only 7% of the global emissions and they are the people who are dying and all the policies about need for post fossil fuels it's all thinking of how ours because we are used to those comforts we want to drive our cars we don't want to give up anything they say no no how can there be development without these things what they are also citizens and in a democracy everybody's vote is same how are we treating them in a democracy do we really call ourselves a democracy if this is the situation so why there is no restriction on these people they are written in in united states they said if you take in the world 0.1% of the richest people the entry to that is 43.1 million dollars the richest person if you have to be in the 0.1% of this you should have a wealth of 43.1 million dollars so they said the elon musk owns a yacht a 500 feet yacht which requires 25 million for maintenance per year that means even a person with the richest among the richest in the world 0.1% he cannot maintain the tax even for 2 years so ugly is the inequality in the world so ugly is the inequality in the world during the pandemic the wealth has transferred up and up the bottom is simply denuded they are made helpless this is not a democracy this is not the way you should allow the people to live this is so much of inequality Uh, this antonio guterres said climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals when i am talking like this i am named as some anti national or a, as our anti development or things like that we are used to that i am not bothered about that because we are speaking truth but the truly dangerous radicals are those that are increasing the production of fossil fuels but the sad part of it is even public institutions which are doing consultancy jobs they are projecting coal as a sustainable development uh, they are projecting chemical industry which produce enormous waste as sustainable development as models of sustainable development just because for the consultancy fees this is the sad state yes. investing in fossil fuels infrastructure is moral and economic madness we don't need any more coal and oil we are already emitting 3 billion tons of nearly 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year if we don't have oil and coal resources coal is there plenty but oil and gas there is nothing we are importing already 85% of oil and coal oil and gas from outside so why are we going for that we are building infrastructure on oil pipelines we are building infrastructure on gas pipelines spending thousands and thousands of crores of money is it wise investment we have to we, we have already committed by 2070 we will go carbon neutral so we have to close everything after some time and if the world goes bad we won't it won't even take off even few years afterwards we have to close everything because nature will not allow you to function how this for example when they are building so many alcohol plants carbon dioxide is a by product one pro- pro- project i have read in the telangana produce it will produce 340 tons of carbon dioxide per day and that has to be sold where will you sell how do you transport it and will you lay pipelines for that and if you lay pipeline where will you take that gas if you use it in soda making all that is again going into atmosphere where are you saving the energy by doing such projects nobody is it is all short sighted political convenience and those industries are started mostly by political people 
all the alcohol factories in the state they have political connections they are owned by the politicians or their venamis because i i so i think time is running out i have to quickly go okay sorry this is this is something this is uh, an india what bottom 50% middle 40% how much they are responsible for this then i will i will skip this thing there is not much time yeah these two young girls how passionate this has been discussed across the world so millions and more than so i think several uh, tens of millions of people have watched their video they have they have thrown tomato soup on a van gogh painting but they were very careful that painting is protected by a glass that they knew the painting will not be demonstrated but this throwing act was debated very very much on the internationally what they say everybody says then these girls are saying what is worth more art or life and on a dead planet what is the value for art they are saying are you more concerned about the protection of a painting or the protection of our planet and people what is the priority those young girls are asking and einstein told us the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil but by those who watch them without doing anything people who are questioning the girls action do they do anything okay you tell them those girls are wrong but what are you doing to preventing the damage to the planet nothing i will only sit and comment on the people that's all this is the whole problem with this this is what the scientists are directly acting now scientists are indulging in private my social responsibility as a scientist is to do everything i can to prevent climate breakdown i fear there is a real disservice that we are doing to wider society by not voicing our fears i can't imagine many academics got into academia because they wanted to be an activist but as well as academics of course we're citizens we've got responsibilities so what's the role of scientists and academics well they're in a position to understand what's happening you know it's serious you know it's serious you know it's only going to get worse du weißt dass es ernst und du weißt dass es nur schlimmer wird you're a scientist You are an academic. You are a citizen. You have a lot of power and you know what's going on. We're racing towards a precipice. If we fall over it. Governments keep making promises. But they don't do anything. We will pass a warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this decade. Unsere Stimmen haben Gewicht. Wir haben eine Verantwortung. We need now scientists in the streets. Scientists are more trusted than politicians and journalists uh, and business leaders it's time to level with the general public and tell them the whole story vor cop 27 werden wir unsere bisher größte aktion starten this october along with hundreds of scientists uh, will engage in civil resistance to narrow window we don't have time to waste and there's no one but scientists who can take the lead in this. This is now the Mississippi River, mighty Mississippi River at the side of the river. That, that small rock that is there will be a tourist spot. Now people can walk to it. They will want it. This is Shanghai, the Yangtze River, third largest in the world. This is what is happening. These are the climate scientists protesting against the meeting of the leader on the health. They said these are all scientists. They are protesting over it. And they have actually, done 50 scientists energy transition. Now they are talking about natural gas at the country, but not in our country. We don't have natural gas, so it cannot work because the natural gas when we are using it leaks. They found that if it leaks around 3.6 to 7.8 percent of the total volume that we use. So at that time when they calculate the water, the greenhouse potential, it is worse than coal. 
natural gas becomes worse than coal as a greenhouse uh, uh, this potential so there is no point in going for natural gas this is there so much research from stanford from cornell university they are producing their papers all that i have also quoted the two papers below here and for india also society uh, center for sustainable energy policy delhi they said natural gas is unlikely to be a bridge fuel for india because we don't have natural gas first of all we have to import so this is for 1.5 degrees how much of fossil fuels existing we can do it is a research done at university college of london first they did the research before the paris agreement for 2 degrees centigrade now after the paris agreement that that they said it is now 2 degrees is too much we we should go for 1.5 degrees they have done the revised study for how much coal we can use how much oil we can use without transgressing that limit they said world has to leave 89% of coal in the ground 58% of oil in the ground and 59% of the gas in the ground in case of india because we are given a better leverage as a developing country india has to leave 76% of its coal 47% of its oil and 35% of gas by 2050 we cannot exploit it but we are expanding our coal into hasdiya forest recently the people there protested the tribals there protested they are destroying the deep biodiverse diverse hasdiya forest for coal mining is it necessary thank you ah uh, whatever it is see when we have to calculate how how the see, there is a carbon budget scientists have calculated 320 gigatons of carbon budget was available for us at the time of the paris agreement for not transgressing the 1.5 degree limit cc limit there are many ways of reaching that so by 2050 we have to reach zero emissions so you can come by straight line you can there are different paths i have given there okay you can see that i don't know what so so what is the least the area under the curve represents the total cumulative emissions so the lowest curve is the one which will give you lowest cumulative emissions so if we if we have to follow that path are we doing that we are not doing that we are the more we postpone the more difficult it is we said we have promised earlier uh, entire world all the governments by 2020 we will start bending the curve of the carbon emissions we have not even begun to bend it 2021 past 22 is going to be further high so when will you save this when will we follow our own words this is natural gas i think there not much time i will skip, quickly skip there not so much talk about green hydrogen green hydrogen is possible only with solar energy not otherwise they are promoting the all these oil companies are promoting blue hydrogen from natural gas and blue hydrogen is worse than coal worse than non original natural gas and also when you use it as hydrogen the thermodynamics comes to play again when you burn hydrogen only 33% of the energy can be used when you use it in a motor uh, in an automobile or anywhere else or for producing electricity so there is no point in doing that so they say instead straight away burn uh, natural gas you, you you will save all that inefficiencies downstream so the hydrogen is not there. the carbon emissions is given so the, 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 the when you compare hydrogen is not at all uh, actually and when you have to go for blue hydrogen you have to standardize the carbon capture and storage technology where will you store the carbon dioxide where is the technology for it the the plant that is now produ produce uh, removing carbon dioxide from atmosphere it is able to remove only 3 seconds worth of carbon emissions per annum what the world is releasing into atmosphere we we throw out around 3800 crore tons per year now actually if you put the other greenhouse potential it becomes 5000 tons 5000 tons so when we take that what it can remove is 3 seconds worth of emissions we don't that technology is nowhere near completion so we have to move long long ahead and when you do that removal it consumes energy again it consumes energy again 
with the limitations of the thermodynamics. This is the problem. So, renewable energy. We, we think that simply replacing fossil fuels into renewable energy will solve the problem. But the understanding today is we have to cut down our energy requirements. We have to live with much less energy. And most of the energy is propagated and wasted. For a good comfort, some, some research is going on in what is the energy required for good life. One D. Narsimha Rao at Yale University, he has been publishing papers on that. So you don't require this much energy as we are doing now today. There are, there are alternate ways of living, alternate ways of living good life. So why are we not opting for that? One million British thermal units of natural gas requires three gallons. Ethanol requires 29,000 gallons of water. So this is about the ethanol I was talking about. I will give you. So it requires so much of grain to produce uh, ethanol, 7.54 billion liters. The Indian government wants to produce 10.16 billion tons of liters of ethanol for meeting, for blending for blending for automobile fuel. 10 billion means 1,000 crore tons, 1,000 crore, 1,000 crore liters of uh, ethanol. Okay. So is it really, when we have to do that, how much of additional water is required? How much of additional land is required? That has to be considered. And according to the EFI estimates, for if you have one hectare of solar panels and you produce so much electricity and you drive an electric car, and if you are to drive the same distance using ethanol blended petrol, you require 187 hectares of land to produce that ethanol, to produce grain and that. Is it available in this country? So why are we doing this? These are all verifiable facts. Let the government answer. And who has written the ethanol policy? Some babus in the government departments. None of them was a qualified scientist. They were all IAS officers. They only know how to please the government. Of course, the scientists also in the same boat in India. Whatever the government wants, they will write the report and give. We have seen it. They are only rubber stamping. So that's why not only here. Professor Mary Christina Wood, environmental law professor at the University of Oregon, she has written a book called Nature's Trust. I have to close it, sir. 